I'm joined today by John Crutchley, who is the Deputy Provincial Grandmaster for the province of Lincolnshire. Thank you for joining me today, John. My pleasure. Uh, John, uh, if you don't mind me saying, um, I toast you at every festive board. Mm. Um, you are one of these people after meeting you a number of times, is, is that you are one of those guys in the background who does the work, not necessarily at the front being the showman. Nothing wrong with that. So I'd like to get to know a, a bit about you. Um, and I'm sure the, the, the chaps in the province would as well. Is that OK? Yes, of course. It is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> firstly, what do you like about being Deputy PGM? I enjoy the responsibility of it. Um, I enjoy how much it's widened my view of Freemasonry. And um, I'm very privileged, um, obviously, with um, the role um, or with the office comes all sorts of different responsibilities. And as you say, probably a lot of them are in the background. Um, <clears throat> I enjoy that, too. I don't have to be in the front of everything. Um, I don't want to be in the front of everything. But I do enjoy, I do enjoy the role. I really do. And as I say, I'm privileged to have it. Something that I never, ever expected. You don't dream of those things, do you? Can you remember when you were asked? Yes, I can remember when I was asked. I was asked formally by um, our provincial grandmaster, David, and um, he asked me um, in the office at Grimsby one morning when we were there for a meeting. And he asked me if I would consider um, being his deputy. Um, so I didn't say no. What role did you do before you were deputy? I was assistant provincial grandmaster. And, and was that under Graham Ives? That was under Graham Ives, yes, it was. And is there a difference between being an assistant provincial grandmaster and a deputy? The duties are slightly different, yes. Um, and the difference main, mainly is what's going on in the background. Um, the um, assistants are more out in the front all the time. Which is, which is great, that's where they should be, and, and they're the ones that get the message out, and, and they get it out very well indeed. Um, I do do that um, at installations, etc. but the majority of my work is more or less background work, yes. Please. Responsible for the provincial office and making sure that everything, because let's be honest, <coughs> there's certain things that have to take place in masonry. I'm not responsible for the um, provincial office, that is Worshipful Brother Tony Miller is responsible for that. Um, we work alongside one another and um, I can say at this point he is a great help with everything. We call him the godfather of the province and he certainly he is. A, he is an exceptional, he's exceptional, an exceptional person. Um, you've been in the role now, is it about five years? It will be five years coming, yes. Um, in the last five years, the big thing that's taken place is has, has been COVID. How do you think the province and Freemasonry itself coped during COVID? Well, COVID um, <clears throat> gave us really opened up Freemasonry for us in a way. It, it was advantageous to us, if you wish, although I don't like to put it like that because of the suffering that went on with, uh, with everybody and, and the impact that it had. But the impact that it had caused all sorts of problems for people, loneliness uh, being one of them, being worried about how to get their prescriptions, being worried about where to get their food. And I'm talking about not just Masons, but elderly people within our community. And it gave us the opportunity there and then to start to do something about that, which we did. We've, we have, and not just our province, um, produced thousands of meals and distributed them to people who were in distress basically and the other thing the other advantage that it gave to us we managed to locate uh, the general 
people in the general public who probably were having problems accessing their, although they lived alone, they were all right on their own so long as they could get their medication. A lot of them didn't know how to do that. If they couldn't get on the bus and go to the um, surgery, they had no idea how to order it online and indeed even how to get hold of it. So there were things like that which came out. But what it did really was opened us up more or less to the social media. Um, um, Grand Lodge had already started on that well before um, the COVID pandemic. But um, it allowed us um, to really open up and, to, and for the general public to see us as a good force. And uh, the force, I mean, by relief and uh, assistance and, and charitable ways that, that we have. So th th that was a really advantageous point for us. That's how I see it. Moving on, um, <clears throat> the programme master, Jonathan Spence, has set up his uh, seven-year strategy uh, for, not an, for, for membership and making sure that we grow as, a, as an organisation. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's an absolute must, really. I mean, <clears throat> my thoughts are this, that it's, it's pretty common knowledge that 10 years ago, across all the provinces and districts of the Isle of Wight and uh, the Channel Islands, that we, we had 200,000 members. 10 years to this date today, we've just over 150,000, which is a loss of 2.5% per annum. And what that does is lessen our impact that we can have out um, uh, with our charitable means. Um, because if our numbers continue to fade away, we can't have the impact that we do at present when there's disasters or within our local communities. So this has had to happen, is, is strategy. Um, it's not come too soon. It's, it, it is definitely, definitely needed. Without criticism, do you think it should have come sooner? <sighs> or is it one of these things that it, it evolves and it just, this is the it, right time? It, this was the right time with the change of the programme master. Um, it is his, basically, conducted by him, started by him. It was his, it, it's, you could call it a dream, I suppose, but it's a dream in reality, it has to happen. And for the new programme master to bring it out as he has, that, that is the right time. And he's brought it in almost as, as, he, as he was inducted in as, as the top job. Absolutely, in 2022. Yes, I do. Uh, and do you think Jonathan Spence will be a force, uh, obviously for good, but but, you know, particularly drive this one forward through the provinces and it he, ultimately into the lodges. He will drive it forward. He will make sure that it's driven forward, and and we all have got a part to play with it. I was about to say, what, what what do individual lodge members in Lincolnshire and obviously other lodge members from other uh, provinces? They might be listening to this. What what do we need to be doing differently to ensure that not only do we retain, but well retain but also bring in new members as well mm. and retain them obviously we have to have a greater understanding of the pathway the members pathway the answers to all of this are in there in one form or another and it's not been embraced adopted by every mason in the province or indeed in other provinces but i would really express the wish that the members of lodges do embrace it, get to know it, get to understand it. There's an awful lot of learning in there and there's help out in the province in any event with our L&D people, our mentoring schemes and everything like that. It's all there to help. So long as we start to understand that, we can see the reasons why things have happened to us and how they will continue to happen to us if we don't use this facility. Because the, the pathway is a tried and tested technique, which in essence is classic sales, which is get them in, retain them, yeah. and, and then nurture them and carry on with it. Isn't yeah, it? absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. Yes, that's quite right. Uh, we've, had, um, we've had Mike Clay. 
and we've had Jason Fitzgerald um, on the chairs earlier on talking about how they're going to bring new members in and and mentor them. But I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind me asking, just go a bit deeper in, in the loss of members and where the weak points are and what we as, as Masons can do to plug those gaps. All right, yes. Well, our loss of members, uh, quite simply, yeah, the, the major part of the losses are uh, or occur in the first three years of any Freemason's three years. career. Yes, they do. And it's in that three years that this province loses 20%, one in five of those wow. Masons by resignation. There is another area of loss as well, which sometimes isn't noticed because it gets shrouded in other, prob uh, in other ways or descriptions of, of why the loss is or where it is. And that is after the immediate past master's mm -hmm. chair, you know, anybody getting to the chair is taking eight to 12 years to do that. And whilst they're doing that, they're completely in the center of everything. So she went, you're in the, that top job, you're the top doc, aren't you? Everything's yes, around you. absolutely. So then when you're immediate past master, you still have work to do. And in some lodges, yes, they'll be the tiler for a year or they'll be the chaplain for a year. But it's at that point, sometime after IPM, where these people can be overlooked and not, not isolated on purpose, but will feel isolated because they're not given work, not offered work, um, opportunities to assist in management, et cetera, so that, that's them got, by. So that's got to be the job of the DC, just to you know, almost touch base with everyone and just say, would you like a part in the next second degree or something? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Yes, and the master as well, because basically the DC is under the control of the master. True. So it's a responsibility of the master and the DC to make sure these things don't happen. What about the, the 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 loss of people, you know, the younger that chaps that don't tend to stay along for for a while? I mean, I know we we. What are your thoughts on those? Well, there again, um, I think we've still got an awful lot to learn about our mentoring, our our mentoring, because if we mentor correctly, we should be keeping these people. If they've been interviewed correctly in the first place and they understand what they're coming into, what we expect of them and what they expect of us, then the chances are that they will stay with us if they're mentored well. If they're not, if they're left by the wayside, it's obvious what will happen. I mean, a figure that, uh, that uh, I was told today, which absolutely shocked me, is, is that there's two types of people can join masonry. You've got the sponsored ones, which mm -hmm. is come along, I know you, and then the non-sponsored ones, which have come from the internet. Mm -hmm. And it absolutely shocked me that the ones who are non-sponsored, i.e. come from the website or mm. social media, are less likely to resign. Yeah, absolutely. That, that amazing. Mm. It, it, well, it is amazing. I think it sent a shockwave through Freemasonry in general to realise that. And of course, obviously, it's come about because of the uh, new digital marketing campaign. Um, when we've had this opportunity of of bringing these people in from the internet. They have studied it. The younger people, in lots of cases, they're, um, they're savvy with the websites. They know what they're looking for. They know how to look into these things. They're full of knowledge, basically, almost full of knowledge about it, when you start the interview process with them. So the unsponsored ones are those that have a better understanding than those that are just brought in by a friend. Because I think a lesson learned here is for anyone watching this who has got a sponsor or candidate is you can't just say to them, come along, you'll find out. You've almost, you actually have to sit down with them and talk to them, don't you? Yes, you do, absolutely. As if do. they weren't, yes. if they were like a, a, an online, an unsponsored. Absolutely. Um, what, what other tips would you give to lodges with regard to attracting new members? Well, attracting new members, the best way of attracting new members is to be out in the local communities as much as you possibly can. Um, as a force for good and letting people see what you're doing, why you're doing it, who you are. And that goes through to also in inviting people 
as Masons, we should be inviting non-Masons to our fishing matches, our shooting matches. Yes. Anything that we're doing like that, our um, car runs, anything. I think the lads at uh, Skegness, they have like a breakfast club and they invite they people along to come they along. They do. And I know there's another another centre which will have like a, a curry evening every couple of months and, and invite yes, people they along do. to that. Yes, yeah. um, it's almost, it's almost you've got to introduce the people first before you introduce masonry and yeah, create, create a bond there, because it's all about relationships, isn't it? It is, yeah. Well, if, if you look at the strategy, part of the strategy going forward, um, uh, Jonathan Spence is extremely keen on the light blues. Well, he knows as well as everybody else that the light blues will, f will bring in younger people mm -hmm. because they'll bring friends in who are not... Um, Masons. Yes, it's as simple as that. And, and 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 the light blue clubs have got a big part to play in this. And it's something that we're, I wouldn't say we're particularly weak on in Lincolnshire, but we're. We could be better. We could be better. And and that I, I'm sure in the next couple of years we will we'll see a big change. Uh, well, we've got to do because basically the program master wants to see that change, and if he wants to see the change, we'd better produce it. I think it's a fantastic organisation and I think we are doing ourselves a disjustice if we don't pass on what we get from, from being a Freemason on to our friends. I think sometimes we come up with excuses why we shouldn't ask people <laughs> as opposed to come along, you know, because let's be honest, it's just a boys club, isn't it? With this structure, there's a purpose, but fundamentally it's getting out of the house, giving yeah. the wife the, the remote control and you're out because you're only meeting eight times a year, aren't you? <laughs> yes, that's all. <laughs> Absolutely, that's all. <laughs> if only. Yes, if only. If yes, only. Well, and again, look, but joking aside, you need to tell the guys that it isn't just eight meetings a year, is it? It's eight meetings and eight rehearsals and the lodge of instruction and the, mm -hmm. oh, no. Mm -hmm. But if it's a hobby, it doesn't. It flies by, doesn't it? It does fly by. There's no doubt about that. But again, the, you, you talk about the wife having the um, remote control. We cannot do our Freemasonry well unless our partners are absolutely with us on it. Nothing hidden from them. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And that and that in itself can bring about losses. If there's some friction in the household because the partner doesn't clearly understand what a partner is doing, then there's going to be an issue. Mm. And that could be from a financial point of view as well, particularly, especially if it's shared bank accounts. Yeah. What's this for? Well, oh, yeah. as much as that, didn't know that. Well, you can understand that sort of thing. A anybody um, in their right mind would want to know where their partner's money was being spent and why. And so if there's a good lot of it going through to um, um, charitable causes, then she needs to know that and understand why and what it's doing. Or he needs to know that and understand why and what it's doing. So, yes. John, thank you for your time today. It, uh, it's been very insightful. I've really enjoyed our chat. And on behalf of the province, I'd like to say thank you for the role that you do as our Deputy Provincial Grandmaster. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure being here.